Welcome to the third and great awakening on planet Earth. The time, whether you realize it or not, many people have lived on this planet and didn't live during the time of an awakening. But you are here for such a time as this. And great is the kingdom. And we like to speak the name of Jesus here. We like to sing about it. We like to talk about it. There is no other name. You can be seated. A time will come one day. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, be, there's a place called the great is, is the second death. Second death will be at the end of the thousand year millennium. And those who, who have rejected Jesus, who says, I, I do not want to take part. I do not want him. I do not want him to be Lord and Savior. Th they will be brought forth even from the places that, that, that they are, which, would, that, of course, would be hell itself. And then it says every demon, you could say, will be extracted, even Lucifer himself, and they'll be brought before Jesus. And before they're sent back for eternity to a place of utter torment, every demon spirit and Lucifer himself will be forced to bow their knee before Jesus and say, you are king. Well, we gladly this morning say, <laughs> you are king. <laughs> you, we, I said, we, we gladly this morning celebrate that he is king of king and lord of lord. If you haven't been born again, you can get born again this morning in about five seconds. Just say, Jesus, save me right now. You say, well, isn't it a long prayer? No, it's like when Peter was drowned, he said, Jesus, help. And he, well, actually, he said, help. And that, that's about all he could, had time to say. Yeah. It doesn't take a long prayer. When you call on the name of Jesus, he gladly comes to rescue you. Yeah. Rescue yeah. you. Yeah. Colossians 1, 4, 14 said that you, there was, there's two worlds. There's two kingdoms. And he translated you out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. So we celebrate King Jesus here this morning. And so um, before we get our message this morning, we, we begin talking about it, um, and it all goes together, and the titles are changing if you keep up with titles. I'm not really good at titles, but we have to do something with it. But uh, we talked about is God in control. That's a big subject in the world. Is God in control? And half the, half the Christians say, of course he is. And, other, and, and some Christians say, well, not entirely. And then, then they fight about it to, you know, to the end of their life. Is, is God sovereign? Of course he's sovereign. Is, is God running everything? I hope not. Can he? Yes. If you give him authority in your life to work, he will work. But if you don't give him that authority, he won't violate your will. He gave you, he, he gave you a free will, didn't he? And so we won't, we won't go all back to that. If you want to visit those messages, you can do so. You know, audio, or you, can, you could go to video on Facebook and you can see all that. Don't have time to go back there, but we've kind of been weaving our way through that. If God's not in complete control, in other words, is God having his way all the time? If God's in control, then everything he wants is happening. Is everyone saved? Does he want everyone saved? Is, does he want everyone saved? Is everyone saved? Is God getting his way? He said, go into the highways and... Uh, and the hedges, and uh, he says, go, go into the city, go into the villages, go into the, go into the community and compel them to come in and fill my house. Is the house always filled? Is God always having his way? Not always, is he? Is he sovereign? Yes. Is, why? Because sovereignty means is he, is he king? Is he all-powerful? Is he all-knowing? Is, all, is he all omniscient? Uh, is there any power higher than him? No. But is he running everything? No. If you, got, if you have, if you're a any student of the Bible, if you ever went to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because of Adam's transgression, Adam and Eve's transgression, they were, the, you, you could call them the federal head of mankind, that they, they sinned, of course, as you know this, and they were separated from God, but thank God for Jesus, who rescued us. But having, having done so, the Bible says Satan at that point became the God of this world. It doesn't mean he's God in the sense of our God, but of this world system, it belongs to him. Uh, some say, I don't believe that. Well, it's right there in Scripture. Then if you want to go over to where Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, one of the things he tempted Jesus with, he says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, 
all that you see, I'll give to you. you Jesus didn't say, well, it's not yours, because it was his, because Adam committed treason and he gave it over to Satan. That, that time, if you want to call it that time, allotment, some people call it that lease that, that Satan has on the earth because of Adam's transgression, it ends, it, it ends at the time that Jesus comes back in the rapture. So, uh, time is short. Time is really short. And so uh, Satan is doing all that he knows how to do. And uh, because he knows his time is short, the, the Revelation tells us that he knows his time is short. And uh, in other words, he's pulling out every stop. We was praying back there this morning and had a good, a good time in prayer. And I, and I just uh, heard this this morning. And we won't go there, but, but I, knew it was, uh, I knew it was the second kings. He was talking to me about during prayer. And uh, it's talking about the king of Syria when he's warring against Israel. And you might remember that, that uh, the king of Syria would make plans against Israel. And then he would send troops out. But the thing is, the prophet of God intercepted the plans because the prophet of God could hear the plans in the king's bedchamber. And then he would just go tell... <laughs> He, he would just go tell uh, the, ar the army of Israel, said, tomorrow this is where they're going to attack you at. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the prophet's a seer. That's what he is. He's a seer. And so he, he could hear everything the enemy was planning. And uh, um, uh, when I heard that this morning, uh, first it's like he almost gave me a title to what he was talking about. And we was back there praying, and I didn't know what it meant. And he said, the, he said, the walls are paper thin. And he said, the enemy lines are, are thinner. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then he said, then he, was he said, Second Kings chapter. He said, so go read it, he said, before you come out and minister. And so the walls are paper thin. You ever, you ever been in a house like that or an apartment or a condo? Or, and people say, Shh, be very quiet because the walls are just paper thin in this house. Well, the king's chamber, it's not that his walls were paper thin, but the prophet could penetrate through all of it. And uh, so the king, it really upset the king because every time he went there, his plans got messed up. He got thwarted. So he said, I want, I want to know right now, he said, who, who's against us? Who's the spy in my camp? And someone had enough sense to say this, none of us know. He said, it's the prophet. The prophet, he can hear everything that you say from his house. Your walls are paper thin to him. And... Uh, so it really made him mad. So he says, so Elisha is the, the culprit of all this. They said, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Take a whole army down there, and, and do, you, can we, do we know where he's at? Oh, they, they said, oh, yeah, he's in Dothan, uh, Dothan, Alabama. He's in Dothan, Alabama. And uh, <laughs> they said, well, it says Dothan. I don't know if it's probably in Alabama. But anyway, I said, he's in Dothan. And so he says, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll go sneak up on him and capture him. And bring you back, and I'm going to kill him. And I think, how do you sneak up on a guy when he's already here and everything that you're playing before then? I mean, I thought that was like du double dumb. You got a double dumb uh, bachelor's degree from dumbness or what, what? But the Lord really didn't actually show him that he's coming for him. But the next morning, you know, his the, the Elisha servant wakes up Gehazi. And he goes, you know, and he goes to Starbucks and gets his coffee and brings him back, you know, Newsweek and uh, Charisma magazine. Just kind of kidding about that. But anyway, he sees a whole mountain full of, of warriors. Of the king has sent thousands of troops to capture two people. And so he, he, he's highly upset. So he wakes up the prophet. He says, he says, oh, he says, oh, 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 man, oh, 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 master. He says, we are in lots of trouble. He says, what's the matter, son? What's the matter? And he wakes up. He said, look, we're surrounded. He said, ah. He said, there's more than us to be with them. And Gehazi was like, uh, oh, I know you're getting old, and I know you hadn't, you, hadn't had two, you, you hadn't had two cups of Starbucks yet, but look around and count again. One, two, 500, 1,000, 15, 25. You know, he was counting the regiments of soldiers. He says, son, he said, Lord, just open his eyes. So he can see the truth. And the Lord obliged him and he opened that young man's eyes. And all of a sudden he saw that there was more troops, that more angels, more, <laughs> more help that God sent that surrounded the king's chariot. And Gehazi, all of a sudden he got emboldened. He said, you want some of us? 
Well, it's not in there, but, but that he felt emboldened now that he could see what Elisha already knew. Amen. So you're here for such a time as this. And uh, we're going to, uh, uh, well, I got a one-minute video. Michelle was talking about a while ago. I was talking with them, uh, Emily Parker uh, yesterday. had a good time talking to them. And they're going to uh, ask them to make this a video because uh, they have a lot more plans this year. And uh, I told them how happy I was to hear about their plans because I said, I said, I know you don't know, but we've been talking about increasing our capacity to receive. And you guys are in your 20s. And this is not just the only trip. They have something much bigger planned for this fall. And I don't, I don't want to get into it right now. And it's not, that, uh, we're, it's not that they're asking you to do things. But they're asking you uh, to be a partner with them. Partnership is not just in sowing finances, although that's, if there's no finances, there's no mission trip. I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, right? Uh, so, um, uh, I mean, if you go to the store, you know, like Walmart with no money, you don't bring anything back. Well, some people do. But <laughs> my son <laughs> works there, and that's his job is to make sure if you do that, that you don't leave there. You, well, you do leave there, but it's in a police car. But anyway, uh, <coughs> so, the, so the deal is uh, they, they're going to tell us about a trip that they get planned for the fall. But, uh, yeah, that kind of snuck up on us. That was my fault. But anyway, yeah, 57 65 due on April 1st. And then that will be uh, the balance of Brazil, Peru, and Romania. And some of you might have saw this little clip. It's just one minute. But uh, to uh, kind of belabor the point that Michelle was making, um, she said, you know, we were ministering to the school, and there was 1,500 children in there, and every one of them prayed to receive Jesus. The teacher is 31 years old. She speaks Thai, but she also speaks English very well. And I'm just thinking, you know, in a modern world of technology and in a modern world, and, and someone who's an educator and who's learned the, the English language, how could you have ever got to the age of 31 years old and you've never even heard of the name of Jesus? And I said, you know, I said, I know y'all have many times, and I know... Uh, Pastor Matt has, and different ones been on mission trips. I know you've run into this, but I said, but look, I'm I'm over double your age, and I've been in the, I've been in ministry longer than y'all have been alive. But I'm not that old now. But anyway, but I but uh, you know I said, but I've really I've been I've been in the ministry longer than they've been alive. But being in the United States as a pastor preaching is different than being on the mission field. So I I have never. Uh, I can't think of one time. I, I've, I've, I've ministered a lot one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, ministered this way, you know, thousands of times. But, but even one-on-one, -on -one, I've, I've got to witness to people, pray for them for salvation. But in the United States, I have never started ministering at the place of, you know, sometimes we say, do you know Jesus? Have you received Jesus as your Lord? And people say yes or no, whatever. But I've never had one person say who? And I said, Jesus. They said, who's that? you gotta, you got to go back to like, okay, in the beginning. <laughs> See, I, I've never started at that place. And uh, so when they began to tell me their plans, I was, I was really excited about their plans and that they're, that they're borrowed many vessels, so to speak, to increase their capacity. Because not, I, I'm not talking about just this trip, the 5765. Parker's a student. Uh, and Emmy's graduated working for the ministry, but Parker is a student. So when you're a student, I mean, you, you, you're not running around like, um, uh, you, you don't have churches to go to, you have partners. So they're, they're, they're believing God big time. See what I'm saying? And, you know, when you're early 20s, what, what, it, naturally speaking, there's no way to do what they're asking to do. So I love the fact that they're, they're putting that to a side. I said, so, so how are y'all doing this? And she said, well, he said, what we've been doing is we've been reading scriptures about, you know, the harvest and about increase and, and uh, these kind of things. We've been kind of getting our mind focused on the bigness of God because we, we're going to have to have some big things happen, you know, to do the fall thing. And I won't talk about that now. Even Pastor Matt will talk about it and, and, and hopefully be on that video next week that I asked her to do for us. So, anyway, here's the video. If we're ready, are we ready? It's only one minute.
So what was your name? Um, my name is Keith. Keith? Yes. Okay. And are you a teacher here at the school? Yeah. What I do you teach? teach about math. Yeah. Much yeah. math. Okay. So you were telling us about what you felt from this presentation? Yes. And you said, was this the first time you heard the story of Jesus? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing because that is the first time that I heard about a Jesus, right? Wow. <laughs> How old are you? 31 years old. You're 31? Yes. Wow. Mm. And you never heard about this before? Yes. No right. one tell me, oh, I can hear it. Mm -hmm. That or anyway. Wow. Well, we're so glad that you prayed today. Yes. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, yes, I'm too. I'm so glad to, uh, so glad to everyone coming to here and learn all tell about the Jesus. Thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, thank mm. you. Now she knows. Now she knows. So, well, if you uh, if you have your Bible, if you want to go to uh, Matthew chapter 11, go there. And we'll get to there in just a moment, Matthew the eleventh chapter, and I'm gonna make some comments before we get there. But to, today we're gonna call we're gonna call this the King, the Kingdom, and the Priority of the Kingdom. And so we, as I said, we started off talking about you know the the, the sovereignty of God is God in control, and then we went beyond that uh, and talked about if He's not, then we have to understand from the Scriptures in, in Genesis chapter one that God created man. They said, "Let us make man in our image." Who's who's us? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, let us create mankind in our image, in our likeness, and let us give them dominion. Let us make them like us, and let us give them dominion. So this is the dominion mandate, it's the, it's the dominion principle. There is not a greater message that I know of to speak than the kingdom uh, I'm gonna throw some scriptures at you today. I I, I, I like to whether we t uh, I won't turn to all of them for the sake of time, and I won't I won't even begin to scratch the surface of of how many scriptures there are about the kingdom. If you'd actually like to know, then in the in the, uh, in the gospels, the church is mentioned twice, and the kingdom is mentioned over a hundred times. The Bible says it, by every you, you need at least two witnesses. You need to have you need to have two places for you could even consider something being a doctrine. For a word to be established, you need two or three witnesses on it. I think a hundred would do it. And, and that's just in the Gospels. And so Jesus' top priority, uh, you might say, was salvation, but uh, that is true, but actually not so. He, ne he never even preached on salvation that much. The Bible says he came to seek and save the lost. And you heard me say this before. If I was an evangelist and, I, and, all I was, and I was out just to make sure the lost were saved, I'd use that scripture over and over and over and over again that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. But that's not really what that, that scripture is not even talking about that actually. Because when Jesus was on the earth, if he was seeking for who was lost, well, it would have been everybody, including his mother, Right? Until he gave his life, who wasn't lost? So what was it that lost? What was it? What was what was lost? What was lost was in the Garden of Eden, through the transgression of Adam and Eve, they lost their dominion. And so Jesus came to bring restoration. So we're talking about a number of things. We're, we, you know, we're, we're talking about dominion. We're talking about kingdom. We're talking about restoration. We're talking about God's big idea. And, uh, and he told me to share this, but he, uh, it was kind of funny. I had a, a, a good friend of mine uh, who has pastored and, and is a businessman, and he called me this week, and Michelle was in Publix, and the way we do that is she shops, and I sit in the car. And uh, she, said, she said, I'm going here with shopping is a pleasure, and I'm going to say, well, I'm going to sit in here where it's more pleasure for me than to wait on you. She said, I'm going to get a couple things. I said, really, look, neither one of us really believe that. <laughs> You know, it doesn't take an hour and 15 minutes to get two things. <coughs> if you want a couple of things, send me. <laughs> but if you want a couple of buggies, send her. Praise the Lord. And I'm glad that we have those things. Anyway, anyway, so I, I get this phone call from a friend of mine, and he says, he says, just wanted to catch up with you, and then I said, I want to share something. Well, he had actually texted me before. He said, could you call him back today? He said, I just got something I want to discuss with you. 
And I know it's going to be kind of something you know plenty about, but I just want to share it with you. And so I, I, uh, I said, well, I, I guess now would be a good time. So I, he, I, I called him. I said, can you talk? He said, yeah. And he says, well, I'm just, man, I'm just fired up about this thing. And uh, I said, so what is it? And so he began talking about what the Lord sharing with him and told him, you know, to, to study all this year. And then uh, he said, I just felt like I was supposed to call you for some reason. I said, so, so, so what is it? He said, he said, well, he, he asked me to study about the kingdom of God. And he went on and on and on and on about that. And then he says, so, so, so what's, what's the Lord have you preaching on right now? And I said, well, last week I was preaching about the, king, the kingdom and, and his reign. He said, oh, wow. So we're on the same page. And I said, yeah. And I said, this is, this is a, a miracle, too. I said, why? I'm, he said, I said, because you, you're hearing from God so good and you live in Auburn. He said, oh, Eric, he said, I said, Am I? <laughs> he said, that's why I hear good. I said, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't, that's the way it works. I said, okay. So that's the way it works. There's something called, I uh, read about this years ago. Has anyone ever heard of a principle called the, it's called the uh, exclusion principle? I uh, read about it years ago. And um, it's a principle that states that two objects or masses cannot occupy the same space at the same time. I'm putting it in the most simpl simplistic terms. It's much more complicated than that. And uh, it applies, of course, to physics and chemistry, saying that t two masses, two objects at the same time cannot occupy the same space. But I don't believe that that's, that is uh, only just for physics or chemistry, but I also believe that it has a spiritual application such as a spiritual warfare in the sense that, and I know you could agree with this, that the, the devil and you do cannot occupy the same space. In other words, faith and fear do not coexist at the same time. You, you, you can't be in faith and be in fear at the same time. You can't be overtaken by fear, but, but your mind be at peace. You agree? Can you be full of joy and depressed at the same time? Is that possible? The theory or, or the principle of exclusion. Can you be in light and darkness at the same time, physically or spiritually? Is it when the sun goes down and the sky turns dark and it's 1 o'clock in the morning does the son just say, you know, I'm just tired of sitting here. I'm just going to go ahead and come on up back up. Never happened in my lifetime. In other words, they can't cohabitate at the same, at the same time. And, and so sometimes people live a life, and I think what they do sometimes is they survive. I hope you, I hope you listen to this. It's, it's not just a, a saying. It's not just fill in. But I want you to get this because we're talking about the biggest, we're talking about the biggest idea that God has. Uh, is, is what the gospel entails in the sense of you can think of all the things that happen like salvation, deliverance, uh, healing, um, any type of healing, emotional, physical healing, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, anything that's uh, the major priority, you know, such a, and we would say salvation is number one, but everything comes under the heading of the kingdom. Everything does. So when we, when we think in broader terms of the kingdom of God, then we're thinking more in his realm how he thinks. I think past, pastors sometimes, um, they can have more tunnel vision because their assignment sometimes is more to, to a local body where a missionary, an evangelist, you know, they're, they're out all over the world. So they just by, just by term, just in the terms of what they do, and, um, and how they do it, they get a different point of view than a, than a pastor sometimes who's just saying, okay, we're doing this in the church and we're doing this. And, 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 and you know, it, everything's out there, but you're not, you're not as open to it. You, you can almost lose your edge on that. <coughs> and and I, I don't want to do that. I want to increase my capacity cause it, so I can see the kingdom in much broader terms. And I want you to be able to see that. And uh, I, I know that you do, but I, but I, I just want to reinforce it. And we do that every time that we're doing when we're ministering uh, here to the local body, but we're ministering on different platforms, you know, and uh, 
all around the world. We're ministering to uh, close to 40 nations this morning uh, simultaneously. This message will go to 35, 40 nations uh, at, uh, this week. Uh, we, we're on different platforms preaching live this morning, not just on Facebook, but other platforms will come in live right now. So we're living in such a time that, that is so different that no one 50 years ago or even, you know, thought that, that you could do it the way that we're doing uh, uh, and, and taking the kingdom public so fast. So what he was saying this morning, and I heard in prayer, he said, not only are the walls paper thin, he said, but the enemy's attack line is, is, is thin. And I asked him why uh, when I got back to my office. I said, why is that? He said, because the kingdom has increased so much. He said, the enemy doesn't have any more dem demonic spirits. He said, in other words, like they're overworked and underpaid. <laughs> and, and, you know, they're, they're not populating. And so they're, they're stretched thin. So sometimes, you know, it, it's just what a veil is. You know, a, a veil is not something that's always thick. You, you think about uh, uh, a bride and, you know, she has a veil. It's not that you can't see through, but you can't see clearly, and there's a purpose for the veil. And then the, the husband's glad he wouldn't take the veil off because he gets to kiss her, right? And, uh, but, the, but the veil is right there. Well, the, the, there's a thin line between, between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And sometimes you may feel like because of the pressure that you're living in or, or the thing that you're dealing with, you may think it's so complex and there's no answers to it, but God knows 100,000 million ways in one second to fix it. But if our mindset is like, I don't know what I'm going to do from here, that's fine. But he didn't tell you you had to know because he knows. You, say, you might say, well, Pastor West, you don't really understand my problem. I may not understand your problem, but I do know who, but I do know who your solution is. You don't have a problem that I don't have a solution for. Because I'm still talking about the king, King Jesus and the kingdom. Jesus is king, and he's not voted in for four more years. He's not Democrat or Republican. He doesn't need a democracy. He is a theocracy. He is ruler. You do not cast a vote for him. He is in power. The devil's not even running a close second. When the, when, the enemy, when the devil goes down during the millennium, you know, during the millennium, we're going to be back here on the earth for a thousand years. So <clears throat> you might think when somebody gets 70, is old. You know, people talk about, well, you know, I'm just about to reach retirement and get my Medicaid card in, and I'm going to be older than, you know, old. You're going to get a new theory of what old is in the millennium. Because when you leave here, you're going to get a brand new body that's going to last you for eternity. And you're going to like it. <laughs> you're going to like it a whole lot. It's going to be the same body Jesus has that walks through walls. So, I mean, I'm going to have fun with that for a long time, just walking into people's mansions just like, hey. Because <laughs> you're not supposed to be doing anything wrong, are you, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and I invited people over from, uh, y'all have an imagination. I don't know where you're, <laughs> but to the pure in heart, see, everything's pure. So I, I don't even know what y'all talking about. But <clears throat> I've told people for years that I, I'm just believing God for, you know, some little simple things. Uh, I, I, I mean, I some, it makes it sound like I just eat ice cream every day. I do not eat ice cream every day. It's every third day. But <laughs> No, I don't do that either. But, but I don't think it would be that hard for God to make a new flavor, one new flavor every day for eternity, do you? I don't think that stretch God. So if you want to have ice cream, just come on over. You're invited at any time. How about that? And uh, I'm going to have Moses, and, you know, I'm, I, I want him, to, and they're going to bring in the video and see the whole thing, and, you know, he, he's probably going to be in a lot of, he's invited to a lot of people's mansions. Amen. So, uh, the kingdom is so, uh, uh, the kingdom is so large, if you think about it, and you think about it like this, <clears throat> one third of what Jesus did in the Gospels was healing. People who studied the, you know, the, the, Somatics of it said, you know, actually one-third of his activity was healing. But now listen to this. Jesus never preached one healing sermon. One-third of what he did was 
healing and deliver people from demons. But he never prayed for a sick person. That's the kingdom. People say, well, I know we prayed for the sick. <clears throat> no, you think you know that. Now go, now go find it in the Bible. You can't find it in the Bible. You say, well, he healed the sick. He healed the sick. He just didn't pray for him. He just healed the sick. In, in other words, if I don't know, if, if, if you had your finger mashed in the door and I'm standing there and, and for some reason you can't get to the knob or whatever, or, and, and I can, do you want me to pray about open the door or do you want me to open the door and let you out? <laughs> Jesus didn't need to pray about your healing when he, when he is the door. <laughs> he could just open it. Is that, that simple enough? So he, so he never prayed for healing, and he, and he never prayed uh, for a demon to be cast out. He just cast it out. Why? Because what was he doing? He was, he was preaching the kingdom. He said the kingdom is not here nor there. Don't he, he said people ask, well, wh where is the kingdom? He says you can't observe the kingdom and say, well, it's, you know, it's on the, e the east side of town or it's on the, on the south side of town. The kingdom is everywhere because the kingdom is in you. And, and because we are, we are everywhere. We are everywhere. Um, there's countries, uh, I, was, I, I, don't, I don't have time to get into it, but there's countries that uh, within fi five years ago were 98% Catholic. And after uh, a, a team went in of, of Christians to minister that area, within five years, 70% of those people are Pentecostal, tongue-talking Christians. Why? Because the kingdom expanded. God will send you in the most unlikely places where you may feel like you're making no difference whatsoever. You may not even have a testimony of what's happening, but what actually is happening is the light is penetrating the darkness even when you can't see it. Eventually, the testimony will come. God doesn't need to send a lot of people in there. He just needs to send a few people. That's why sometimes your assignment seems so arduous you know, like this has been a really hard place to bring the gospel to or, you know, get through to these people. But it doesn't really matter because what you're doing is see you're focusing on you instead of him. Take your eyes off you and take, put your eyes on Jesus and understand that light penetrates darkness. Darkness can't put the light out. You heard me say it a thousand times. You can't go to Lowe's. You can't go to Marvin's over here. You can't go to the, our own hardware store here. You can't go to Dollar General and say, I just have too much light in my house. So I want to buy some dark bulbs, so when I turn it on, it'll put the light out. No such thing as a dark bulb, is there? But you could have a basement, and it'd be in pitch dark. But if you just got a match or a, or a lighter, or you, know, you plug in a lamp, you, you turn on a light, then that, that light penetrates the darkness. You see the light. But there's no way to put the there's no way to extinguish light. You are the light of this world. Amen. So as we go into the communities, and as we go into uh, the, from the church, you are the church. You are the ecclesia, the called out ones. That means you're called from out of here, not called to come hear sermons. That's been the problem for so long. We've done church completely the opposite of the way the Bible teaches. We've come trying to do church and, and say, how, how many people can we collect? We're not collectors. Pastors should not be collectors. It was never God's idea for someone to come to hear a one man, one woman. Uh, I don't care if they were articulate. I don't care what their gifting is. It was never God's idea for, for everyone to come and, and just listen and take notes to what one person knows about the kingdom, and that's how your life works in the kingdom. That is part of it. Because if you understand, the Bible says God gave gifts to the church, and he talked about a five-fold office, but the five-fold office was to us to teach and to perfect the body so that they would do the work of the ministry, not so that they would come watch someone do the work of the ministry. Everything's backwards. So we wonder why things don't work as they should. We wonder why we don't reach our cities, our schools, our universities, and our communities and our workplaces. 
it's because the salt has lost its savor. It's been shut up. It's time to get the salt shaker and turn it upside down. So like Michelle said, because the world is upside down, now it's time to stand it right back up. Amen. So the kingdom, Jesus t told his disciples when he sent them out first, by, first he sent them out two by two. He sent 12 out. Later he sent 70. Why did he do that? Because Jesus in a physical body could not be in all places at all times. He is now, but he couldn't then, obviously, right? He came as a man. So he couldn't be in all places. So he commissioned them, and he told them to preach the gospel. He, he didn't say pray for the sick. If you look it up in your Bible, he said heal the sick, cast out devils. He said raise the dead. Well, if he told me to cast out devils and raise the dead, most people would say, you're coming with us, right? <laughs> no, I'm not coming with you. I'm commissioning you. I'm commissioning you to go do this and giving you the authority the power to do it. Wow. So they did, and they came back rejoicing. They were excited. They were thrilled because they said, <laughs> we have healed the sick. We have raised the dead. Just like you said, we cast out devils. They said, the demons are subject to us through your name. And they, they were like, Man, we, we have skint, can I say Alabama? We have skint us up some demons this week. <laughs> Skin them up. Send them packing. And Jesus says, I know. I know. He says, don't, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice that your names are written down in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. So that's who we are. And so this, this message of the kingdom has to be preached everywhere. And, I, and God entrusts you with this message. Once you hear this message, it will be up to you what you do with it. But God is entrusting you to hear this message today and to help me to say it in such a way that you can hear it and go forth with it. Um, uh, Matthew eleven twelve. if you're there, if you, if you haven't found it by now, forget it, you'll never find it. But uh, just look on for someone. But Matthew eleven twelve says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I never really understood that scripture a whole, a whole lot because sometimes the words that's used uh, from the King James is translated into words that we would not use that word today. Because when it, when it says that the kingdom of God uh, f from John the Baptist until this time suffers violence, I'm thinking, well, how, 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 does, how is heaven suffering? Well, he heaven's not suffering violence, even though that's the way that's the, the Elizabethan English. Uh, by the way, Jesus did not use the King James Bible. Y'all do know that, right? You say, what did he use the message? No, he was the message. <laughs> there wasn't a Bible. <laughs> there was the o Old Testament manuscripts, the scrolls, right? <clears throat> so when you do a little word search, the word violence in the Greek is the word biaso, which means to use force. From the, from the kingdom, of, from the day of John the Baptist, when he began to preach the kingdom, the good news was so great that the people, by force, came in with them like droves into the kingdom of God wanting them wanting what John was preaching. I think I can give it to you better from the from the uh, the Passion Translation says, from the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. Does that make more sense? So let me give you a few scriptures. We won't go to any of them because we don't have time. Our, our time's uh, limited this morning. But this has to do with the, orig the original uh, mission of Jesus. And his first public statement as an adult, Jesus' first public statement as an adult, not his first statement, but his first adult statement. In other words, he, he's an adult. The Holy Spirit has descended upon him as a dove. He has now started his public ministry. He's 30, 30 years of age, as you know. And uh, in Matthew's account, uh, Chapter 4, verse 17 says, From this time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Some translations uh, say at hand. Um, other translations may uh, say other things, but I think the, kingdom, the uh, King James says, The kingdom of heaven is near, or the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God. It simply means, J Jesus said, he says, in other words, it's, it's a great time because the kingdom of God is near. In other words, the kingdom of God has arrived. 
when you go into the world and you minister the gospel, whatever part of the gospel that you're ministering, salvation, praying for peace, praying for healing, praying for restoration, praying for someone's family, you are bringing the, the kingdom of God just arrived on the scene. You, you can't see just yourself out there. Now, I know you know that, but we have to be reminded of that. It's, it's so much bigger than an individual. Yet, at the same time, if you were the only one left on the planet with Christ in you, you would be the kingdom of God on the earth. And you would be, you, you, you would be the, the, the expanse of what would be in you would be so large. Do not discount what one person by themselves can do with the Holy Ghost on the inside of them. You may feel like, well, I don't know if I could do that. I've never spoke. I never talked. I never did a Bible study. I never did this. Da, 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 da. But if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You, the natural part of you, may not have ever experienced those things, but the one on the inside of you has done it all. You may not have ever cast out a demon, but the Holy Spirit on the inside of you has a lots of practice. And he doesn't need practice. He was the one who created the world at God's command. Pretty cool when you think about the, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and he was the one who was hovering over the face of the deep, waiting on the words of God that said, Light be. And the power, that power created everything that God said, and now the address of the one who created the world, the address the address of the one who created the land, the sea, the, the moon, the stars, the skies, the galaxies, his address is not heaven, his address is you. Everywhere you go, you take him with you. Everywhere you go, the kingdom goes. You're never by yourself. Colossians 1, 27, Paul said this is the greatest mystery that has been, has been hid for ages upon ages, but now is the time to bring the message out. And he said, here is the greatest message that has, ever, that has ever been preached, that has ever been kept secret for such a time as this, and it had to be after Je Jesus' resurrection. He said, now it's no longer God in a box. In other words, it's no, no longer in the Holy of the Holies, in the temple. He's not behind a curtain. Now God lives in a body. God lives in an earthen vessel. In other words, God lives in a dirt suit. And guess who was, guess what the dirt suit is? That's you and I. But we just know from... If you took anything in health, uh, you know, in the fifth grade, sixth, seventh, you know, you, you, you know that you're two-thirds water, right? <clears throat> Which means you ought to drink a little bit more because <laughs> your body's made up molecularly. Of, it, it, it wants water. And, um, and my wife has many messages on that. Doesn't she, Lexi? Yeah, if you got a problem, she says, have you been drinking water? <laughs> it's like, but my, my fingernails are, they need, they're, uh, you need to drink water. But my hair, you need to drink water. So, but she's right about the water. So, that was his first. That was his first uh, declaration. And then in Matthew ten seven, just if you're writing these down, he said, "Go preach this message uh, to the kingdom of heaven is near." What what he actually was doing was now here's what we do, and they're not. And these, what I'm going to say is not altogether wrong. It's not wrong that we do these things, but this is not what this is not what Jesus told us to do. He did, I'm not saying these are wrong, but this is what church does. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But we've got to get back to the message. Why don't we get the results? Well, why did we abandon the message? Je Jesus never said, uh, uh, he, he never, his declaration was never the introduction of religion. He did not say start a Bible study. He did not say start Sunday school. He didn't say have a music or worship team. He didn't say you need a children or youth ministry. He didn't say uh, that he needs a denomination. Now, in and of itself, those things aren't bad. It's just different ways of presenting the gospel. But let's get the big idea, which is the kingdom itself. What he actually was saying was he was, uh, he was bringing a government to the earth. Isaiah 9 will tell you that. And of his government, there shall be no end. When you're in a, if you were an ambassador of this nation sent to another nation, you would be there to represent the United States of America. 
And if you'd have left, let's see if I can say this. If you'd have left this uh, balloon thing up uh, around this week, just to some good old boys on the ground, they would have fixed that days ago. <coughs> China's a balloon, you know, going through the atmosphere. You know, it's just a weather balloon that's kind of, you know, it's got away from us. We can't get it back. Well, we can get it back. We'll send it back to you in millions of pieces. Huh? Well, and legally have every right to do what we did because we are a sovereign nation, which means we have a fly zone, right? Every, every sovereign nation has a fly zone. And if you infiltrate into that fly zone, that government, they'll, they'll respond to you and they'll tell you, hey, you're, what's this? Looks like you're getting close. Do you understand you're getting close? I mean, you're, you're in a jet or you're in whatever or you're, on, you know, you're in a battleship and you're, you're about to you, uh, come into our waters or into our airspace. So we're telling you, abandon your mission, go back now. And if not, we have every right, every sovereign nation has a right to defend its own borders. Is that true? That's why I told you to cast down thoughts and imaginations and every high thing that they saw itself against the knowledge of God. Why? Because the enemy is invading your air zone. <coughs> so which means you, 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 you ought to post in the, in the realm of the spirit, hey, uh, Satan, within me is a no-fly zone. So you can take your thoughts and ideas and imaginations and you can take them somewhere else. Because the sovereign king, King Jesus and his kingdom lives here. You're not welcome here. Any of your ideas or thoughts or suggestions. Doing better preaching than y'all doing amen. All right, here we go real quickly, class. Matthew 12, 28. Jesus said, if I drive out demons, because, because they were telling Jesus, they saw him driving out demons, and they, and they said, well, he, he's the prince of Beelzebub. These really smart people. Really smart people. Jesus is casting out demons, and then, and, and then they, <coughs> they accuse him of being the prince of all demons, of how he's able to do that. Really intelligent people. But anyway, but Matthew uh, 12, 20, he said, But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Matthew 18, 23, and these are different translations. It says, Therefore... The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. I, I want you to hear the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Luke 4, verses 43 and 44. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to all other towns also, because this is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogue of Judea. In Luke, the 8th chapter, in the first verse, it says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the, of the denomination of Israel. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The kingdom of God. Not a denomination, not church. Well, the people asked you if they did not come to church. Well, what, what, what kind of church is it? Uh, what, what denomination are y'all? Uh, what do y'all believe? Well, everybody says they believe the Bible. I find that not to be so true. But everyone, everyone is going to claim. Every pastor will say, well, we, we preach the Bible. We preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. But I've been in some churches, they, they, they could have just tore some pages out. They said, well, now, that's in there, and that happened, and, they, and Jesus did that long time ago to preach that he was deity, but now he don't do this anymore, and so he doesn't heal anymore. He uses the hospital and doctors, and, but he, he did that just to show you he was the son of God, deity, and now that he's done that, he just he leaves you to the doctors. Okay, so we've got to tear all that out. And then they said, well, you know, it's not that the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom on everything, but he wants you to know that, have, of the wisdom and the power and the might of the Holy Ghost and how he created the earth. But he doesn't do that now. God wants you to you know, go to the psychologist and, the, and all this and the counselors and all that, so we tear all that out. And then when we get down to what actually God does, and all you have is the table of contents in the book of maps. You don't have much of it left. But God's never changed. He's never changed. He, he, he's always the same, which is good for you because 
you, you and I don't know that many people that, well, I, I shouldn't speak for you, but I think, I, I think I'm right in this sense. You and I don't know masses of people who's, who's always consistent, no matter what the circumstances is. Because there's a push line somewhere. There, there, there's a button that you can push for some people. Some, sometimes you live with people who have buttons, that, that you, and you know what they are. And if you push that button, this is the response. They can be abusive. They can, they, they can have anger issues. They can have all kinds of things. And, th and then they'll be pushed back. Some of you know people, have lived with people who's uh, almost a volcano, and, and you know just about when it's about to erupt. Hmm? You got really quiet in this Presbyterian church. Hmm? But Jesus is always consistent. He's always the same. But at the same time, he had all the same emotions. He knows what anger is. If you read the Gospels, you see Jesus' anger. But, it, but his anger is called righteous indignation. When you're, when you're in there doing, uh, selling goods in the temple of God, and all that was going on there beyond selling goods, it angered him. And sweet Jesus went in there and turned all the tables over, and, 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 and you know, with a, probably a, a rock and a stick or whatever he had in his hand, he was running them out. Sweet Jesus, the one, the one that you see in the picture with the little, Mary, we had a little lamb, and then she gave it to Jesus to hold, raise it. And now he, he's, he, he's with a rod, you know, kicking them out of the temple. He is sweet. He is loving. He is kind. He is compassionate. He is mercy. You ought to meet him in the book of Revelation. He's called the man of war. He's called the man of vengeance. You don't know that now because you're living in the dispensation of grace. God's not paying you back. I know grandmama told you that. And it's kind of funny. They never said, now Jesus is going to get you. They said, God's going to get you. Is that right? Let me think about it. Most of them never said, now Jesus is going to get you for that. My, my grandmother told me all the time. She says, now you boys, you better stop that right now because she said, God can see everything you're doing. And he's God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. Almost became a song. Or maybe it is a song. It is a song. Oh, my gosh. It is a song. It's a song that God's going to get you for that. We used to sing a song growing up in the Pentecostal church, hymn number, I don't know what, what it is. And, and uh, I don't know if it was what the name of it was, but the lyrics went like this. You can't do wrong in what? No matter. That really encourages everybody. Then they had to figure out, you know, they had a choir practice. Who's the sopranos? You know, who, who's the alto? alto who, who's the baritone? Who's the bass? Then we'd have to come have a little talk with Jesus. Hallelujah. And the bass would get, they, they, they liked that song. The bass would, Gerald's in heaven. I used to sing next to Gerald. I can't sing, but but he was such a bass. I, I, I mean, I, I was sitting next to him, and it was a plywood, you know, up on the choir loft in this assembly church. And they said, he said, have a little talk with, I can't do it, he goes, Jesus, let us tell them all about, oh, and I'm like, ooh, I can, I can feel that up my legs, he's <laughs> like, and, and, and there, there wasn't anything in the back to help him with, I mean, there wasn't no synthesis, you know, whatever, to, they had no knob to twist to make it, he didn't need it, and he'd look at me, sweet, one of the sweetest men I've ever known, and I, and, I, and I went like this, and he knew what I was doing. He, he just looked at me, he, he winked at me, he said, sorry, right, little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I was 14 years old, I was trying to get down there with him, like, I was like, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and we sang that whole song, and what none of it was scriptural. <laughs> Have a little talk with Jesus, tell him about all your problems. He will hear you by and by, because I'm busy right now. He will answer you by and by. If you feel a little prayer, if you feel like the prayer that you're offering is turning, then, you know, we'll get a little fire burning. <laughs> Wasn't no faith in there that blew, that blew. <laughs> there was just nothing there. It was just entertainment is all it was, and very little of that. 
but anyway, Luke 12, 30, uh, Luke, Luke 9, 1 says, But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Luke 12, 31 said, But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Luke 12, 32 said, Do not be afraid, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. Luke 18, 17 says, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter in. Luke 22, 29 says, And I confer on you a kingdom just as my Father conferred one on me. Luke 18, 36 and 37, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Watch here. This is him standing before Pilate. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Ooh, wow. He sat there quiet for so long. And they said, he's a king. He said, oh, so you're a king? And finally he spoke up. He says, you have now spoken correctly. I'm not of this world. If I did, if I was of this world, I wouldn't be standing here. You wouldn't have got me in that whipping post. There's no way. My servants would have fought. He says, but I'm not of this world. Guess what? You aren't either. You're in it, but you're not of it. Praise God. So, real quickly, uh, I got two minutes. There's over 100 declarations made about the kingdom of God. And um, so you'd have to think that Jesus is making a declaration that he here that his purpose and mission, his, his number one purpose and mission then and today is to bring the kingdom through the good news of the preaching of the gospel and through demonstration of it. Not just preach it, but, but demonstrate it. Amen. Through the healing of the sick, the casting out devils, for taking meals, uh, to, to helping people in what might seem small things, through prayer, through, ev through every, for e everything that the kingdom does, you know, whether we're praying, whether we're helping people, whether we're taking meals to someone who needs meals, whether we're helping someone with a light bill, whether we're sending people, I mean, the, the countries that they're going to go to and the one this fall that they're going to go to, there's so few Christians there influence where they're going to be going to in this fall to my uh, Emily and Parker. Um, and all they need, I mean, they're going to go and take king, and they're going to take, they're going to take, people with them. They just need some prayers and some senders. I'm, I, I know you, Matt, you know all about what I'm, what I'm talking about, but um, however you want to say it, Bangladesh or Bangladesh, however you want to say it, that's one of the main issues that's going to be this fall, but they're going to, they're not going, they're not wanting to go just with John Smithwick. They're wanting to finance the whole event. You know what it costs to finance the event? Well, for them to for for them two to go this fall, just the, if, if just for them go, it's sixteen thousand something for the two of them to go. For the for to, to, to go before to set up to go there for the whole thing and then to stay afterwards for a month, they'll need sixteen thousand dollars to do that. But but they want to host the event, which will cost them not. I mean, they'll go, they'll, they'll go blessed by John Smithwick Ministries, and others will go, but they'll be doing the ministry in the king. They'll be doing the ministry, you might say. John Smithwick will not be doing in the fall with them to do the preaching. They'll be doing the whole thing, and they're wanting to finance it. Now, wh what do you do with, with two, can I say this? And I mean, what do you do with two kids and they're 20 years old who has an idea and, and they're in school like, and I, and, and, I, and, uh, and I was talking to them, I said, so, so what does something like that cost? They said, well, you know, we got to have, what, 5,800 to finish, you know, these three trips in the summer. And then the other one, um, 16,000, uh, it was 16,000 
five hundred something dollars. They said, but but now we already have like five hundred something dollars towards that sixteen thousand. I mean, that, that, that's how they put it. I mean, it was like, you know, it, it was all but, you know, but the tax paid on it. And then I looked at it and I said, so how much does it cost for you to do the event? They said, uh, well, it's only 25000 I said, so you're telling me you need about $42,000 this fall? And they said, yeah, that's, that's what we're believing God for. That's, that's what we're reading scriptures for every day. She said, there's, there's so few people who, who's ever even heard of Jesus there. There's... She said, Uncle Eric, there's just so few people who've ever heard of Jesus and time's running out. She said, we have to have the money. I was thinking, I don't know if I was thinking about that when I was 23 years old. <laughs> so how, how can you not be proud of someone who, who thinks that? Can you see about increasing the capacity? You know, whether they hit the goal or whether they don't hit the goal, you got to be proud of that. I mean, you, 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 that you've got two 20-something-year-olds who ain't been married a year, and they're believing God not for, the, for that money to, to live on, but to, to, to go to a country who doesn't even know who Jesus is and live there for weeks, and then to put on a campaign, because it wasn't on, it wasn't on John Smithwick's. Uh, the, the, they're asking to pay for it themselves. If they can go, will you, will you let us go? Because I know you're not doing that this year. Because he can, how, how many can he put on at twenty five, thirty, someone forty thousand dollars for him to go to some of his countries? I mean, the, the ministry, Global Ventures, may have to pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars depending on where they're going. So it wasn't on the agenda this year. This is something they're wanting to finance. And he goes to school and works part time. So does that make any sense to you? No. Now, I'm not telling you that because we're saying we need to come up with $40,000, although, you know, it could be done in 10 minutes. I'm just saying partners pray, partners believe. Because why? T because time's running out. Reinhardt Bunky, before he died, he, he said, I have figured down, he said, I hate to say it this way, but I, I don't know the numbers. He said, I, I figured how many souls I, I can get saved for every five dollars you give me or it was two dollars well, he said wh whatever it was he says for every two to three dollars I can tell you how many people I can keep out of hell and I thought I blow that on the ice cream or, or a combo right so it's, it's the big deal so anyway let's uh let's finish there this morning just remember this, the kingdom of God is it's not a democracy. It's not where every vote counts. It's not where every opinion is important. It's, it's not where the majority rules. The kingdom of God is not the vote of people taking over. because it, It's different because here in the, in the States, we're not like the UK. You know, we've never lived in a monarchy. We've, we've always lived with a democracy where we vote. Not, not where someone is a literal king like in the UK. We, we have people come, you know, I mean, no, no president has ever been president for over eight years, true? Now, you may have that party continue on for another four years or eight years or however many years, but they're, they're in and out. So we, 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 we understand that he's king and we understand that it's, it's not a democracy, but, but I think people who live uh, like in the UK, they, they probably really get this that we have a king, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's the rule of the king, and, and the king is to take care of his people. And so everywhere you go, you take the king with you. Not, not just the message. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going, I don't want to take any more time, but I just want you to get this one idea. I, I, hope it'll, I hope it'll carry some weight with you. When you're, when you're ministering the kingdom in any capacity, whether it's salvation or healing, you're not just taking the message with you. You're taking the king with you. One more layer. And you're taking all the resources. He goes with, he said, I, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Just read the Great Commission. He goes... And he takes all his resources with him. You're never alone. Can you see that? Can you see why the top priority of the church ought to be the kingdom? 
Jesus never preached a healing message, but a third of his ministry while he was here for three and a half years was healing and deliverance. But he never preached one healing service. What did he do? He just demonstrated the kingdom. When people were demon possessed, he, he, he didn't go through a whole onslaught or whatever. He didn't come to bring rules and regulations. Religion brought you that. All, all religion is is man's attempt to find God. People who don't understand this will say, oh, well, my son still they're a very religious person. They tell me that. I, I mean, I, I know what they're saying. I'm thinking, if you knew what you were talking about, you wouldn't put it in those terms. There, there is a pure religion James talks about. But this is not religion. This is relationship. Right? It's a relationship. So the kingdom rules over all. So anyway, I, I hope you got some of that. I got 15 more pages, but we're not going to do that today. So. God is good. So this morning, if you're sitting here or you're listening or you're watching him, watching him, which is not a word if you look for it in the dictionary, watching him. But if you're watching the service or you're listening at another time or if you're in another country or nation and you happen to find us this day, we ex want to extend to you the invitation this day or the time that you hear it. The time will come that the word promised. Jesus said, if I go, I'll go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back again. Our king is coming back. We don't know the exact day or the hour, but we know, we know the signs. We understand that there's not one prophecy left that needs to be fulfilled for Jesus to come. He simply could be here before the sun goes down today. He simply could be here before I can get through speaking. The greatest decision that you could ever make in your life is what you're going to do with the rest of your life of eternity. Where will you spend eternity? You say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how many times I've failed. You don't know how many times I've promised Jesus. Well, they asked Jesus one time because they saw he was compassionate and caring for people, so they, they try to get an idea of, of how he would handle things. They said, Jesus, how many times would you actually say someone should forgive someone in one day if they do the same thing wrong? I bet, what, seven? He said, yeah, yeah, seven. He said, or 70 times seven. 490 times in a day would do the same thing. Did you find it a little bit hard to forgive someone for hurting your feelings 490 times in one day for doing the same thing? Would you really feel like they had much remorse? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, I, I'd like to think that I could forgive someone, you, any of you, 400 times. After about, you know, 15 times, I'm probably going to try to get in my car and go away and get away from you and give me a little time to rest for it, and I'll come find you. We'll start again tomorrow. So you can't tap out his forgiveness, his love and kindness, his tender mercies. Simply to give your life to Jesus is, is asking him to be the Lord of your life. The, on, the only sin that anyone will ever go to eternity of hell for is not, is not the sins, S-I-N, plural. The sins, plural, is the action of the sin nature. You're, you were born with a sin nature because of Adam's transgression. That's why you have to have a new nature, become a new creation. So you, you will never go to hell for sins. And then you can categorize them, you know, cussing, lying, cheating, adultery. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the actions of the nature of sin. Jesus said the only reason you would be condemned wouldn't be for the plural of the sins. You would go to hell only by rejecting the one who paid for the sin. And in other words, he has nothing else to offer you. If, if you don't receive what Jesus did for you, then someone has to pay for it. That's simple, isn't it? Jesus paid the price for all sins, for all mankind forever. But if you don't receive him, then you have to go make a payment for yourself for eternity. Police never do that. So just call upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
I asked him to make plea, beg him if it would help, to make him the Lord of your life. And yes, you'll be, you'll be forgiven of the sins, but then you, you'll become a, a new creature in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that you'll never sin again, but you won't become a practitioner of it. In other words, it, 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 if you make mistakes, and you do, and most of us make the same mistakes in the same area, if it bothers you, good. Because that tells me that the Holy Spirit is right there. If he's not condemning you, he's just convicting you. See, when you're born again, there's, there's, no, he's, he's no, he, there's no condemnation in Christ. So he's never condemning you as a believer of your sins. He's just simply convicting you. And he's not so much convicting you of the sin because his spirit's in you, so you know that's wrong. So what is the conviction actually about? He's not convicting you of sin. He's convicting you of your righteousness because you are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And this is not how righteous people live. Isn't it a wonderful thing that when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God, that even as believers when we miss it, he's really just convicting you, saying, hey, you don't have to do that. I've given you the grace and the ability to live beyond that. So I'm just here to remind you that you're right, you, you are righteous in me. And, and, uh, and boy, I, I know I've told a story, but this, this would have been my last line today, my very last line. It would have been, I put it in meditation. I put the word righteous is a legal term. It's not a religious term. It means to position yourself rightly. Jesus came to make us righteous again, which means to restore us back into right relationship with God. You are qualified to receive all the promises of God. This is critical in developing kingdom thinking. Only those who are in right relationship with the Father can extend His kingdom because it's Christ in us, His kingdom. That's with, that's we, uh, it's Christ in us, His kingdom, and we rule and reign on the earth in the power and the presence of God and in the glory He impacts and invades the lives of our planet. Welcome to the kingdom and welcome to the great awakening. Your righteousness is a legal term. Legally, you're righteous and the enemy can do nothing about it. So e even when you make a mistake, even when you sin, and, I, and if you, and then, then, then just go. Just go to the Father. Don't, don't run from him, run to him. There's no condemnation in Christ, but just run to him. Say, Lord, I, I made this mistake or I made it again. Please for, forgive me for that. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that washed and, and cleansed me. For, forgive me of that. Thank you for the grace of God that enables me to live beyond that. And, and, and I'm empowered to live, not to live in that sin, but to live in the righteousness of who I am and the consciousness of the righteousness of who I am. But even when you make a mistake, because of what Jesus did for you in the past, present, and future, watch this. Even when you make the mistake, you're not losing Jesus. You're not losing his love. You're not losing his relationship. Even when you make a mistake, your foot is still on the devil's head. Even while you're guilty, he's still under your foot. He has no righteousness. How does the unrighteous one place guilt upon the righteous one? How does the eternal damned damn you? The reason why, please listen to the way I say this. Don't say, I, I left here cussing. The reason why it's wrong to say God damn it is because God is not the damner. He's the blesser. So if you want to use that word, just say devil damn it. Because he's the damner. It's not, it's not God. He's, he's the blesser, right? <laughs> I mean, if you just got to say it, then that, that's who the damner is. Just be a devil damner, I guess. I don't know. Just be better just to get rid of the word. But you can't say God damn because he doesn't damn. He blesses. He's nothing but good. Good don't damn. Beavers damn, devils damn. Just go, go with one of them. <laughs> Amen. I better get out of here. I'm going to get in trouble. God bless you. <laughs>